Now let's begin with the quest for political change in Nigeria as we reflect on the democratic direction of a country that was once a beacon of hope for the continent and the black diaspora, but which at some point seems to have lost its way. It was hoped that the 2023 general election would be another opportunity to return to principled democratic correctness, but alas. Back when the drift began and the problems that besmirched this country took hold under military rule, the human rights and constitutional lawyer Clement Wangpo was one of the most vocally critical and active good governance campaigners in this country. And he has the scars to show for it as successive military dictatorships tried to force him under their authoritarian heel. But he and his fellow activists and the rest of the Nigerian populace prevailed, helping to return this country to civil rule in 1999. But then a new type of misrule took hold, driven once again by corruption and the rule of the few over the many, but this time cloaked in the deceptive toga of democracy. So once again, he and many other civil society activists rolled up their sleeves and got back in the trenches to try and protect the fragile rights and privileges of Nigeria's citizens. You may not see or hear his name in this roll call of the heroes of democracy, but he was certainly up there with the best of them. We lost great heroes and heroines along the way. And this struggle, the winner of June 12, 1993 presidential election, Chief MKO Abiola, the most significant symbol of our democratic struggle. His wife, Kudrat, General Sheo Musa Yadua, and Pa Alfred Iwani, amongst others, sacrificed their very lives. They briefly surrendered their fortunes so that our nation might have a better one. Let us honor the memories of Chief Anthony Enahol, Chief Abraham Adesaya, Commodore Dan Sulaiman, Chief Athon Wanko, Chief Chikwemeka Ezebe, Admiral Ndubusi Kanu, Chief Franco Kori, Chief Bola Ege, Chief Adekunle Ajasin, Chief Gani Udaudi, Chief Ayo Fasami, Chief Gani Fawemi, Chief Olabi Idrojaye, Dr. Beko Ransom Kuti, Chima Ubani, and others who have transited to higher realm. The sacrifices of General Alani Akenyade, Professor Bolaji Akenyemi, Professor Wole Shuinga, Chief Rab Obioha, Chief Colonius Adebayo, among many others, should never be forgotten. For at least six years, they bore the pain and difficulties of life in exile. While the exiled pro-democracy activists kept the fire burning, their comrades at home sustained the pressure on military leadership. Among the latter are Olisa Agbakoba, Femi Falana, Abdu Oro, Senator Shew Sonny, Governor Ubasoni, Chivolu Falai, and other National Democratic Coalition leaders, such as Chief Ayo Adebanjo. President Tinubu there delivering his uh, Democracy Day address and uh, giving his roll call of those uh, he believes uh, helped to contribute to the return to democracy in Nigeria. As I said, you may not have seen or heard Clement Wankwa's name mentioned there, but assuredly he was in those pro-democracy trenches. So after a quarter of a century, how is it looking so far from his 
perspective? Well, let's find out, and I'm delighted to say that Nigeria's pioneering human rights defender and constitutional lawyer, Clement Wankwo, the founding convener of the Civil Society Situation Room, who is also the executive director of the Policy and Legal Advocacy Center in Abuja, and who has spent more than three decades promoting democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in Nigeria, joins me now in the studio. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you, Charles. I, I should have asked you to roll up your sleeves so they can <laughs> see can the, the scars <laughs> to, 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 to prove that you were there. Um, but for some inexplicable reason, which I can only attribute to an error of omission, your name was not included in that roll call of democracy heroes that we saw there, and the president omitted to mention your name. I think that's a mortal sin. What do you think? I don't know who wrote the names. Um, it, there are several names that are not there. And for me, I think the, the key thing is to have gotten the job done, getting rid of the brutal uh, military dictatorship uh, that this country suffered under uh, in, in that period. I, I think coming uh, from the several years of um, the brutality that we saw, mm. uh, we were all united in deciding that we needed to end uh, military rule. And uh, there were several others. I, I just read the other day uh, the family of um, Frederick Fashion. That is true. Um, complaining about names not being mentioned. Uh, he was very accomplished. Um, I don't know who wrote the speech, probably Bayon Onugab. His name was not on that list as well, but mm. he was together with the team in Tell Magazine, The Tempo, The News, they were very, very accomplished in the struggle against military rule. I, I think uh, it's not a question of mentioning names. I think it's a question that there were people, uh, some who contributed so very much, uh, but were not in the public layer. Uh, for me, I think working in that period, the most important thing was the vision, the purpose uh, to get rid of military dictatorship. I think we were effective in doing that. And for me, I think that's uh, the most important um, uh, consolation in all of that. Well, I will certainly join the many who will pay tribute to people like yourself because we owe this country's democracy to the likes of you. And I was in and out of Nigeria as a BBC correspondent, yeah. very young, I might add, at the time. And um, I remember interviewing you numerous times. And also, you became one of those faces that were seen internationally that we're campaigning um, to try and get the international community to support um, that clarion call for democracy. So thank you. We owe you a lot. Thank you. And I should say we owe you a lot as well. There were journalists like you who were giving us uh, the, the forum to speak, who were amplifying our voices. Your contributions uh, remain indelible, and it doesn't matter that the names were not mentioned. Mm. The president could have spent a whole day reading out just names, so we, we owe you a lot as well. Well, thank you for that, but I, I come nowhere close to what um, people like you did. I mean, you were arrested, you were harassed constantly. But now that we've had unbroken democracy for 25 years. How do you reflect on that? Or perhaps in your case, I should say 31 years or more, as you were in those, as I said, pro-democracy trenches when the June 12th presidential election was annulled by the military in 1993. Yes, we, we were in the trenches. Um, my journey started before then. Um, as, you, as you know, uh, I created the idea of the first human rights group in this country in 1987. And together with Ulisa Agbakoba, we, we both founded the Civil Liberties Organization. Absolutely. Uh, and so much uh, grew out of that. Uh, and I think that when you come uh, from so very far, uh, looking at where we are today, I think that for a lot of us it's been a um, mixed journey. Um, but in terms of expectations, I think that um, the expectations uh, have not been met. Uh, it wasn't just so much a question of getting rid of the military. It was getting rid of 
the ills that the military represented, the ills that politics represented. Uh, a lot of us remember in 1983 when uh, General uh, Muhammad Buhari overthrew the civilian government of al haji Shehu Shagari and all of the ills that he cited as being the reason why the military struck. Uh, General Buhari came back to power um, several years after that as, and ruled this country for eight years. And it was one of the worst years of democracy, uh, repeating the same tragedy that the military represented. So I think that for a lot of us who um, have seen uh, democracy in this country for 25 years, yes, we are very grateful for that. Uh, but when we look back to 1983 uh, and look at today, uh, the difficulties that Nigerians faced in 1983, the corruption, the abuse of power, the, 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 the economic crisis that the country faced in 1983 before the military struck, is nothing compared to where we are today. Perhaps it's worse. Uh, but we know that when we complained in 1983, when civilians and the population came out on the streets uh, to welcome the military in 1983, uh, nobody thought that the country would descend even to deeper depths, and that's what happened. So the lesson from that is that the military is not a solution to the crisis of democracy. Mm. And I think that um, the generals who seized power, uh, General um, Muhammad Buhari, General uh, Ibrahim Babangida, General Sani Abacha, uh, proved to us that rule by force, rule by dictatorship, uh, doesn't take a country anywhere. And that's why um, we would use the word celebrate in quotes, uh, 25 years of civilian rule. Uh, but there's a lot that lies ahead. We have not met the expectations of citizens. And when you recognize and acknowledge that those expectations that people like you had have not been met, in spite of the fact that you took the hurt, you took the pain, and you helped to open the door to democracy in 1999. When you look at how that democracy has evolved, do you feel hurt, ashamed, regretful? I think it's, it's shameful for the country. If we went through those dark days of dictatorship, if we went through the difficulties of it, um, it is shameful for the country. Yeah, but for you personally. For me because personally. You, I, beyond the country, I mean, you were locked up. You, you were treated very, very savagely on account of the fact that you were demanding unequivocally democracy. I was locked up. I was stabbed on the streets in Lagos. I was at a launch event waiting for some of our friends to join, and one of them was shot to death on her way to lunch with us, Kudi Ratabiola. Mm. Uh, a lot of our colleagues were killed in prison. A lot were killed on the streets. A lot were imprisoned. And a lot of these names uh, continue to be mentioned. Um, so when we see what Nigerians went through, when we see what our colleagues went through, when we look back to what we went through, uh, I feel very, very uh, disappointed. Uh, when uh, General Sani Abacha, who was one of Africa's most murderous dictators, died in 1998, um, we did have several meetings involving several international figures, uh, the South African Vice President then, Thabo Mbeki, the um, Commonwealth Secretary General, several um, heads of states who we met with said to us, get into politics, help to uh, get this country's democracy on the right path. Um, we, we, we doubted that the military or, or uh, led government led by General Abubakar was going to return to democracy. So we said, no, we're not going to get involved in politics. And that was when uh, we set up the transition monitoring group and we said we're going to monitor the military's promise to return to democracy. And so a lot of us stayed out of politics. Unfortunately, those who stepped in and uh, took over the reins of government were the same politicians that we had all complained about. And so the country has not recovered uh, from that past since then. But in, in the context of, I mean, we recognize, I don't think there's anybody in this country who would not uh, admit that after 25 years, Nigeria is still wallowing in the mud. Um, but people wonder, though, given that you guys were in the front line, um, 
Could there have been something better than what we have today? Could you pro-democracy champions have negotiated a better deal that would have given Nigeria something better than what we have today? Or, or was it all about just getting the military out? I think, we, like I said, we made fundamental mistakes. One was that we were very, very focused on getting the military out. Mm. Uh, that meant that because we didn't trust the military, because a lot of us had suffered under the military, we didn't even want to have a conversation with the military. Even when uh, General uh, Abdul Salam Abubakar wanted those conversations, even sent representatives to meet with us and have conversations, uh, because of the pain we had gone through and mm. because of the mistrust, we didn't even want to have a conversation. In other words, that them. might be an excuse for them not to complete the transition, basically. They, yes. they might find some reason. So because we didn't trust them, don't right. forget that General uh, Ibrahim Babangida had committed to handing over power more than three times and failed. It was in the last attempt and in the internal squabbles between him and General Sani Abacha mm. that actually forced Babangida out of office and he put in place a stooge, Chief Ernest Shoneko, as head of state under what it was called an interim government. Yes. And then, of course, the interim government was uh, brushed swept, aside swept quite away, quickly basically. by General Sani Abacha. So given all of those experiences and what we had encountered, we felt that we couldn't trust the military even after uh, General uh, Sani Abacha died, even after the much more liberal uh, um, General Abdul Salam Abubakar was thrown up into power. Mm. We, we didn't trust the military. And so that opportunity of engagement and negotiating power right, was uh, lost, slipped basically. past. We right. lost it. Well, the reason I say that is that I'm wondering whether that might have been, I mean, with hindsight now, uh, whether that might have been the right time to change the system of government in this country. If you look at the 2023 election, for instance, President Tinubu got only about 37 percent or so, 39 percent, between 37 and 30 of the vote, yet he became sole president with all the powers that go with it. But if you look at South Africa, the ANC failed to win a majority of more than 50 percent. It got something like 42 percent um, which is better than what Tinubu got. Um, and yet they have been forced into forming a coalition with the Democratic Alliance, with Inkata, and with the Patriotic Alliance. In a country as divided as Nigeria, with so many quarrelsome groups, might that not have been a better system for such a complex country rather than having Tinubu, for example, leading? I mean, obviously, his. I mean, he's the president now, but I'm saying with hindsight, leading what amounts to a minority government and yet remaining and retaining the fulcrum of the polity. I, I think that Nigeria's politics is a very different, uh, difficult one. Uh, the president in this country is an absolute president. And like mm. you said, um, with a significant decrease in uh, the number of votes that he got, he exercises absolute power mm. and it's not just about him it's about the way that our politics has been structured and that's why there is conversation in this country today about the nature of government that this country need, needs to have uh, the south african system is certainly different from obviously ours. it's a parliamentary uh, it's, system. A, it's a parliamentary yeah. system is is different from ours mm. um so that's why there are conversations here about whether you should have a parliamentary system of government or not mm or even how do you define the emergence of a president? Uh, what nature of votes or quantity of votes needs to be had to form a government? No, absolutely. And, uh, and I think that when you look at the Nigerian system, we, we don't have it right. And also the, the, the saddest part is that the electoral process is severely in, in crisis. Mm. Absolutely. And so, so where, where are we now? I mean, some would say we are where we are, <laughs> but how can the different political forces be fused in such an environment where the ethnic, religious, and regional differences continue to manifest and appear to be so fundamental? 
I think you need a leader who comes in recognizing the shortcomings of our democracy and deciding to put things right. Uh, you need a National Assembly and State House of Assembly who determine that the system of government needs to be changed. You need a constitutional uh, reform process that pulls in an understanding of this crisis. Yeah, but those houses and of, of, I mean, the National Assembly are themselves <laughs> victims of that, those very same political forces they that are we're victims talking about. of it and that's the point i make about a political leadership yeah. I, I think that when I, you know that's why i make the point the june 12 situation or crisis wasn't all about getting the military out although that was the focus mm. when we got the military out we failed the, those who took over power uh, failed to understand that the country had been severely divided and those divisions intensify. If yeah. you look back to the immediate well, they past took advantage government, of those divisions. they took advantage. If you look back to, back to the immediate past government, and it, it's sad that I keep going back to General Mohamed Buhari, but you know, he truncated the Second Republic yeah. and came in very with a divisive uh, agenda, uh, deciding who he wanted to favor. Indeed, he became extremely extremely tribalistic and divided the country in ways that we have never seen before running the country aground basically as a result of those divisions uh, and lack of vision uh, my worry today is that those divisions intensify it's a question now who the beneficiary is and that's really the sad thing about nigeria's mm. governmental system today that we do not have national leaders. We do not have people who have taken over power. And, and yet the, those pro-democracy campaigners like yourself who fought for democracy were completely detribalized. De yes, that was the I basis of that. you came from, from all the different ethnic groups. We came from everywhere. Yeah. And you know, you have names mentioned from the north. You have names yeah. mentioned. Uh, Lagos was a melting pot for, for all of us. And we're able to mobilize from across the country. And yet those, some of those who were in that struggle and who got into politics failed to understand mm. that they had colleagues who worked from a pan-Nigerian point of view. They are in power today, but they failed to understand that this country can only be built on the basis of right. national uh, integration. So, so what, what, what have you learned from that? Do you think Nigerian politicians are just not mature enough and are simply unable to confront and deal with issues in a way that is less deceptive and less disputatious? I think there's a lot of parochialism in politics, a lot of parochial leaders, a lot of parochial politicians who see things only from their prism, small prism of tribal, religious, or whatever divisions they can create. Where those divisions don't exist, they manufacture it in order to keep the people divided and keep a hold on power. We have not seen since 1999 a pan-Nigerian government. Perhaps the closest to that was the first government that emerged, uh, mm. General Obasanjo. But since then, we haven't seen any government. Jonathan did try, though, in that respect. I could he? count him in, yes, as well. Yeah. But, but certainly, we haven't seen, uh, and we didn't have enough of General, uh, sorry, of um, President Yaradua yeah. to know exactly. Although how Yaradua his came across be. at the outset as a uniting force. Yes, we didn't see enough of him to be yeah. able to make that judgment. But certainly, um, what we have today doesn't give me confidence that there is a leadership in this country that is interested in building unity. Right. So I wonder what might give you confidence in this, as I said, you know, muddied waters of Nigerian politics. Could it be, for instance, up to the opposition? Because, I mean, you've, you've cited a lot of issues with the APC, which has been running this country for the last nine years. Could it be up to the opposition to come up with the more mature politics by going, for instance, into an alliance or a merger or a coalition amongst themselves with the aim of not just wresting power from the APC, the same mistake that was made in 1999, just you know, pushing the military out, but really laying the foundation for proper elections, proper representative democracy, and good governance. 
I, I don't, I'm not a politician. I mm. don't see the difference between APC and PDP or Labour or any other political party. Quite frankly, uh, when I look at politicians, I haven't seen sufficient to tell me that um, uh, a lot of these political mm. leaders uh, understand what this country needs. Uh, so for me, those divisions are not a question of which party anybody belongs to. Uh, but I must say something. It's, it's more a case of... Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's regrettable that we never saw enough of President Yaradua. But when President Yaradua was elected in the very, very flawed elections in 2007, he decided that, and spoke publicly about it, mm. that the elections were flawed and that he was ashamed of it. And he set up an electoral reform system or committee. And that committee came up with recommendations and reforms. And um, it was from those recommendations that the committee uh, put it forward that one of our pro-democracy activists, Professor Tahiru Jaga, was appointed to head INEC. Mm. And he discharged his responsibilities very, very honorably. Uh, we have seen a deterioration of election uh, system in this country since then. And I think that the height of it was the 2023 general elections. Mm. And everybody understands that the elections in 2023 was severely flawed, very, very severely flawed. And that this country cannot go ahead to the next elections unless we have a retool of the electoral system. Mm. And we are waiting and we are saying to this president, Recognize the fact that the elections of 2023 was flawed. Yes, you are president. Yes, we recognize you are being president. And this country believes that it's important that you as president succeeds. And uh, you know, I, I sincerely hope uh, and wish the best to this administration that it succeeds. But if we come from a background of fight against misrule, against the corruption of the military, against the brutality and dictatorship of the military, and we are now in power, it's the opportunity for us to actualize mm -hmm. what we have fought for over the years. And what we have fought for over the years, what gave rise to June 12 was the abuse of the electoral process by the dictatorship in the June 12 uh, out elections that were conducted. If we have also conducted an elections, and we now know today that our electoral system is almost a failure, and we don't correct it, knowing what we have struggled for all our years, then we would not have done justice to the dream of June 12. Mm. So anyone who is talking about June 12 must not just talk about the fights that we all fought together to end military rule. They must talk about the ideals that June 12 represented. They must talk about the ideals that we promoted in that fight against dictatorship. I am not seeing that going on right now. The president was in the forefront with all of us in the fight against military dictatorship. He needs to be in the forefront against the ills that June 12 fought against. And I am not seeing that yet. I hope he would see it. I think it's important that he sees it. But if he was to rule and complete his tenure of four years and come back to seek re-election, the question would be, did you try to do what was right by June 12, that you are an apostle of? Very, very profound. Thank you very much indeed, Clement. Clement Mwangpo is, of course, a pioneering human rights defender, constitutional lawyer, founding convener of the Civil Society Situation Room, executive director of the Policy and Legal Advocacy Center, and he spent more than three decades promoting democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in Nigeria and was one of those pro-democracy pro activists that helped this country along the way to democracy in 1999. Thank you very much. Thank you.